Hello everyone, today we talk about the siege and the Battle of Vienna 1683. For those of you who have been following me over the years, this will be a familiar topic comprehensively because from quite some time in fact, I made several videos uh, relatively not just to the Battle of Vienna that we never actually discussed per se, and in fact even this video is not specifically just about the tactical reconstruction kind that I discuss battles specifically like but also the campaign um, and the broader international uh, background context uh, that of course we approached also for for other topics other than the 1683 campaigns so everything uh, concerning this topic can be found uh, all to, uh, altogether in Modern Warfare playlist, that is for sure the Modern History playlist, then there is a lot to made about Ottoman Warfare, Polish Warfare, um, recently we have gotten a bit more in Early Modern History. I'm actually planning to make similar videos to this about Prince Eugene of Savoy and uh, Raimondo de Montecuccoli and resuming, especially the former series that I had also started, some of you surely remember, a couple of years ago, but that I eventually inter uh, interrupted. I could re-upload actually the videos uh, I was making in chronological order about the life of Prince Eugene and starting from that again. So since last autumn I began this kind of more targeted um, choice in video making regarding the big armies, military historical events, um, and we will keep doing this for the sake of the channel because I think that sometimes laying the cornerstones, even generic as they can be, like in this video, uh, but still paving the way a little bit in, in that direction, eventually filling the gaps as I can do uh, the way you, you, you see every day on this channel, I think uh, can help structuring Schwerpunkt better. And, of course, I will not add so many details as the ones that we have already seen. As a matter of fact, made multiple videos about the Siege of Vienna in 1683. Um, I made, again, several videos about the Ottoman military in detail, right? So if you are interested also in the um, military historical background, the army organizations, the tactics, etc., I covered an important amount of that, too. Um, Today I would like to focus, of course, on the broader relevance of this phenomenon. I will not probably make um, kind of political or moral cultural criticism of the siege of Vienna's reception in today's popular culture, because uh, I think, first of all, it deserves a video on its own. Uh, but it's obvious that it, it's difficult to ignore the broader m meaning and symbol and, and relevance that this uh, event uh, anchored Nate, right? And going even beyond that, in fact, more anecdotal, uh, chronicistic or prosaic approach that we have today, right? The, for most Europeans, I must say, I think the Battle of Vienna is, of course, loaded in uh, the the reminiscence at least of a meaning that more or less is kind of uh, easy to trace especially in the conflictual dimension um, but is not more at, at a strictly historical level and also political cultural meaning more than, uh, than a name and a date right a cartoon like thing uh, that too often unfortunately very, you know, unworthy, I would say, um, movie makers and uh, other persons in search of easy views, etc., um, tend to exploit, right? And uh, telling this the story, um, depleting it of all its deepest significance, in my opinion. And from one side, you have a conservative dimension that fundamentally cheers uh, at the event but that literally doesn't know anything about that because let's erase this childish um, 
idea that being conservative has anything, but I mean, even the slightest trace of any traditional awareness or or any form of moral dignity mm, relatively to to the meaning of the past um, and properly the divine, universal and imperial understanding. And secondly, that uh, a, a nationalistic approach, which is socialistic at the same time, unavoidably, um, has anything to do uh, like in this event, like you know, it's either a German thing or a Polish thing, um, or whatever you want to look at the story, like a Turkish thing, um, per se. It's a universal event that mm, so the manifestation of the Imperium in one of its most clamorous form, the charge of the Polish Hussars of Jan Sobieski, is by far the single most important cavalry charge uh, in the history of mankind and it, um, it, it even if it were just for this and of course in a world that completely doesn't understand what strategic cultural education is I mean people talking about uh, we are seeing it because war uh, has become um, sadly you know closer to at least the, the mouths of people nowadays from both sides of the aisle uh, speak of literally nothing right um, and from the other side of course the liberal perspective on this that oh my god whoever talks about this age of Vienna is essentially uh, a Nazi per se is uh, somebody that wants to, to exterminate the Muslims it's somebody that um, of course doesn't know any history first of all but you know of course liberals do right no of course not liberals basically in history have you know um, at least conservatives uh, make uh, a disgusting but still a use of history, right? Uh, liberals uh, basically live as if history had never existed. Um, and uh, I think that the, the latter is worse, uh, by the way, but uh, by approximating standards, uh, you know, the, cu the current political identities are just an abortion of the dignity of mankind and, and nothing else, right? You know, claiming... To be a conservative or liberal should just cause profound shame for the complete lack of parental upbringing, first world primary education that you don't get even if you are uh, up broad in the first world nowadays. Not that the rest of the world is anything, the rest of the world is shit. The primary world is just in absolute terms better, but there is nothing flattery about that. And of course, of complete lack of personal dignity of any trace, right? Uh, out of the imperial universal tradition um, there is no dignity right because human per se means dirty from humus it, it literally speaks of the fall of mankind from a state of divine superiority right and if you still pretend that anything man-made or man-measured um, is essentially worth of any value I think you have some problem there that fundamentally uh, makes beautifully, as we can see nowadays, the fourth estate sinking yet again in the state of inferiority that pertains to it after this pathetic, you know, uh, follow up of the boom uh, and that was just carried out by a few worthy people, not really by the masses, by any stretch of the imagination. The only worthy recognition of mankind is in God-given power that is manifested, according to universal tradition, exclusively in holy combat, in the doctrine of struggle and victory, and of self-sacrifice, right? That manifests itself on actual power waged on the world, right? So for all the pathetic powers nowadays that are pretending that they are of any uh, cultural relevance, right? Just because leaving aside things like the second military power being, uh, you know, humiliated by the, the 22nd and of course revealing the, the the radical cultural inferiority and underdevelopment and putrescence of course of everything that can emerge in that case from 70 years of communism um, if we're not talking about you know what happened before that just because it's an ancien regime doesn't mean that it has the moral strength that in fact God would have obviously entrusted them if they had been worth it that um, and lots of other con considerations that you can see all around. So let's stop using history to flatter ourselves, especially in a moment in which any trace of sacred, of faith, and of actual 
mankind uh, power uh, is is absent right it, it's just um, it's just uh, clownesque I, I presume and the question here is how much can we learn from a historical event like this uh, even just in the in the simple telling of the story I, I will try to, to make a point probably of course I will discuss other topics that are relatively unrelated to this at least in in the habitual way of, of, of storytelling but that are always connected with this because we have abundantly given a look at what was the Holy Roman Empire at the time, what was what was Poland at the time, what was the Ottoman Empire at the time, France, Venice, etc. And we have already profiled, even in those times of course, a loss of um, the awareness of the sacred in the heart of men that the Battle of Vienna instead revitalizes in a way that I think even just from a didactic point of view is quite useful to bring on the fore, back on the fore, what is actually the greatest part of um, European identity. In I'm Here we're talking about the Holy Roman Empire, large parts of Central, Southern Europe, the same world of Catholicism that had maintained the, the, the faith in the work of men in order to contribute to salvation, which is the direct legacy of the what we improperly call, in fact, pagan. It, it was still Catholicism, as a matter of fact, in imperial times um, uh, of the ancient world, and um, that we have skipped, I think, entirely, like um, like a an area of culture, and especially modern and contemporary times. Like here, uh, it seems to have come back to a sort of, again, nationalist, socialist view, right? We just consider some, because it's the thing, when I say nationalist, socialist, I'm not referring specifically to Nazism or Hitler. I'm, sp I'm specifically referring to what emerged after the Ancien Regime, that is, both nationalistic and socialistic at the same time, because the two concepts cannot ever be distinguished from one another. And again, I know that the two things uh, seem distant because, again, you are a product of national socialism, so to you, that's how further anti-tradition has split, cancelled, destroyed the awareness of human quality, right, of mankind quality, if we can be more proper. Um, and you see the two things distinguished, but uh, let's say the, the idea that um, there was a universal power that, that had the God-given right because it was led by an elite, by people who were actually worth anything, right, um, to rule over the rest of the world. And earning it to the fullest was already forgotten in these times. We're still in San Regime in a, in, in a considerable dimension. But it's, it's always relevant. It's always attainable. Right, the world ages, but the awareness that, for example, Europe per se had maintained the Imperium for such a long time, in a in objectively difficult circumstances with enormous tectonic forces that were emerging from the same continent, and also, as we see, um, in also as enemies of, of the same empire, and the Ottomans having the Roman crown, I mean, the, the Ottoman sultans had Caesar as a title, and this is pretty well known, right? So it was still at the time understood, at least by a degree, that um, worth does not stem from where you're born, but what you actually achieve, right? And this struggle that was immense, right, that re provides you with the scale, first of all, of the glory and the honor that derives from defeating an enemy is actually a very powerful one. Whereas most nationalism, socialism today, starts from the premise that basically you, that, that, that enemies suck, the culture suck, that everything sucks because you're basically um, just judging uh, a color, a box, uh, an imaginary abstract, where you're not actually judging the effort that even, say, uh, an Ottoman vassal could, could have in putting together the, the enormous effort that uh, and, and what uh, what was behind that moral in fact to want to to seize Vienna for example there's something that today whoever you are you don't have right it's not because you are again of, of a specific background that you are better 
then in that case, even what you think is your enemy today, that's why you know the conservative perspective in many ways is it's ridiculous today because again it has nothing to do with tradition and the very tradition that those men as Jan Sobieski, as um, Charles of Lorraine, of Starnberg, of Prince Eugene, and uh, everybody who was involved here um, and fought and died for the ideal, um, many noblemen that truly embodied that Iranian Apollonian power, but, sure, but, but many other, even common people from, as you will see it, all over the Holy Roman Empire, even from, even from Protestant countries that in theory were happy, like at least in the establishment, to actually support the Islamic Ottomans against Catholic Europe, but that felt the, the, the obvious universal urge to throw themselves into that meat grinder because they were perfectly aware again of the doctrine of struggle and victory, of the universal tradition, and they knew that they could and they would get the imperium uh, in the process. It's very didactic with, with the French example. Think about Prince Eugene that literally abandoned um, Versailles, even though he wasn't uh, very lucky there and probably wouldn't have many perspectives, but because his brother had been fighting um, and dying, as a matter of fact, uh, at Petronel Carnuntum against uh, an, Ottoman, an Ottoman detachment, and was essentially to rise as the, the greatest general of his times against the same greatest power of all, that was France in, in Western Europe, um, exactly a France that had refused to help uh, the Habsburgs because also of the interests that surely Louis XIV was quite pragmatically um, embodying uh, to expand in Germany um, in that sense. So there is, as you understand, so much too much not to... Uh, hint at this dynamics and showing how they reflect uh, in today's world. Um, this was a clamorous Ottoman defeat and one of the most glorious Catholic victories. Um, it's difficult to present it in, in many other ways. That's the truest meaning of this all. And I'm talking about Catholicism not just because, of course, there had been a fracture of Catholicism by states that of course were emerging from the, the moral decay of the same universal system but that were also uh, doctrinally denying the, um, the, the value of works and thus also of, of holy combat uh, for the sake of salvation and that in a sense were slapped in the face by this uh, clamorous coming back of what was objectively um, a weak country. I mean, the Habsburgs uh, were at this point an, or an anachronistic power that, that uh, hadn't managed to, to modernize sufficiently, and there is a way to, to modernize traditionally as well. Divine reward is to be measured, in fact, in, in military power. You can hardly uh, deny that in the uh, rejection of uh, state building of the Polish Slachta was the destruction of the Commonwealth and in fact the the humiliation of Poland and of, of many other countries that actually gravitated uh, around her um, uh, to the advantage of a more barbaric and underdeveloped uh, country like uh, the, the Tsarist power that also at that time was basically just emerging from, from the Middle Ages and moder being modernized by Western standards, right? Not surely by the uh, the, the Russian ones, that, or Mongol ones, because at at that point the Moscovy had been literally created as as a Tartar uh, principality. Um, but more than this, and you, I'm not exaggerating. I perfectly know that it still like, already existed before. But you know, we made several videos about um, medieval the medieval Rus and. Uh, it's notorious that Moscovy was the, the single most obedient servant of the Golden Horde and uh, the one that basically resembled it the most uh, as a state compared to, to the other lands of the Rus that were um, by b before Mongol times actually much more like Central Europe than what we call in fact because of Mongolization of e Eastern Europe. Um, the same goes also for, for the Ottomans because from an Islamic perspective 
um, the Ottomans had accomplished something clamorous, right, um, in, in the eyes of God. Yet this blow came as a as a sanction of a, of a broader failure, of an outstretching, of actually of a uh, the the end of a gigantic cycle of expansion that saw the empire fighting constantly on three fronts at one. If you look at its history, um, and so you you really wonder even how uh, the Ottoman Empire could last so long and with such high military standards as they 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 had right when Montecuccoli crushed the Ottoman army at the Battle of the Rab that saved Vienna right given her 20 years because it, it literally didn't have any defense at, at that point right had the imperial forces been defeated there Vienna didn't have bastions and anything like it was it was Muslim that's yet another thing that now we will stress on. but Vienna yes could become uh, a Turkish city with tall minarets and imams preaching uh, you, you would argue that today, because of uh, of Islamic immigration, that that's pretty similar. And yes, that that's a reality. If you if you um, have visited Vienna, you love her as, as much as I do. Uh, I think that that's something you can recognize there, in also in, in this dialectic. But um, the point being that after this defeat, the Ottoman Empire was essentially never able to. St- right back not not just Vienna it was safe for for good in that sense at least from from the Ottomans uh, but that uh, however at this point literally had a choice to modernize further to westernize further and remember that the Ottomans had actually always been very open to where that were essentially a western power themselves let's be honest I mean these weren't had basically nothing to do with Turks from Central Asia these were uh, born and bred Europeans Right from the Bosphorus that created an empire was essentially the overlapping of the same Byzantine one, um, and uh, there were so many Christians in the in the Turkish army at Vienna that you know decided also it, Orthodox and Protestants. Just think about the Hungarian ones that were countering the Habsburgs there. So that it's how complicated that is, but that's also the essence of the universal empire in many ways that the Ottoman power had managed to c- to convince. Um, to to remain uh, under such uh, a regime for a long time, so that even some kind of anti-Ottoman rhetoric for nationalistic reasons in some countries is somehow ridiculous. When you know they the, the, the Ottomans ruled for half millennium and basically people remained under there, and no, they weren't threatened from annihilation uh, every step of the way. They were just basically deciding to come participate to it because you know if they had wanted to die for their country they would have done it and they had the choice they didn't right so again that's the only standard that exists in universal tradition and if you fall short of it uh, it's your fault and nobody else's that's the beauty of um, of divine justice that there is no such thing like wishful thinking when um, a rule is is involved um, so the the, uh, the there are many ways to tell the story and of course there is a picturesque one a scenographic one of the the huge ottoman army moving to storm the capital of the mighty holy roman empire um one could naturally refine these definitions further and again that's what i do in detail in all those videos about the topic because the situation was pretty messed up as you know but there is no exaggeration especially if you look at the powers involved and how they experienced this whole event and uh, the importance that Vienna had for example in the broader or scale of things for for example Ottoman conquest uh, again I will not digress on all the various issues the fact that at some point even Warsaw could be threatened as opposed to Vienna that however there are important uh, limits uh, strategically logistically but even more so politically so that even if Vienna had fallen no you would have not found the Ottomans on the mouth of the river Thames as many eco I think it was given this one I don't know but let's say uh, there must be in fact, a- an accurate assessment of the dimensions and the, the proportions of these events that that is completely missing, I think, in today's world, even in the most uh, contemporary events. Um, 
so the possibility of the Ottomans to literally make Vienna a, a possession of theirs was real, right? To us, it may border fantasy, but the Austrian city more than once risked becoming Islamic. During the Renaissance, the Ottoman Empire held sway throughout the Balkans, right? The Hungarian plain was open and practically there's no boundary with, with Vienna. Um, and uh, of course, even today, you can see how impacting the same Ottoman rule could be in um, in pretty close countries. Um, several areas of the Balkan Peninsula, such as Bosnia, that are majority Muslim, still today as a consequence of the Ottoman domination. Uh, the first real Turkish attack, we've seen it recently in the video about the Landsknechts, um, on the walls of Vienna took place in 1529 under the leadership of Suleiman the Magnificent, the, by far the, the most successful Ottoman ruler, um, that however so like uh, a failure, not just on this occasion, but you know, testing the, the boundaries of, um, of the hardcore of Western Europe and thus halting this. What had been apparently since the, the previous generations like an, an unstoppable tide Right. Remember that um, there was nothing deterministic, even until a few decades before uh, the fall of Constantinople, about the Ottomans succeeding in achieving the, the scale of power that they did. So this was actually a very fresh power. Not even 1453 was like it had to happen. Right. That's um, you know, one of my greatest dreams is to reconquer Constantinople, that I always call like this, still to this day. Um, but I don't call myself Constantine, so uh, I, at least by, by prophecy, I shall not be the person. Uh, in any case, of course, I'm kidding, only to a certain degree, though. Uh, and um, I, I support enormously the entire kind of you know, Christian perspective. Uh, depending also on which Christians we're talking about, because everybody knows that in 1453 it was essentially the Byzantines that opened the gates to the Turks, right? That this, this is basic uh, updated historiography and not a, not wishful thinking. And and this fits the, the, the idea of Ottoman rule that I was talking about before. Um, but the Turks could be defeated in 1453. Uh, there was nothing, again, deterministic about the fall of Constantinople even at that point. But as there wasn't anything deterministic about Vienna not falling in 1521 or in 1683, right, and it's a hell of a long time in between that, again, makes you wonder, again, how did the Ottomans make it to maintain such huge powers and standards, right? before the anecdote on the Battle of the Rab is that when, and I forgot to say because I, I, I digress uh, yet again, is that when Montecuccoli seized the, uh, the Ottoman camp, he, he was also in quite interested in gunpowder, um, looked at these various barrels, and looking at these uh, very fine, in fact, black powder, assessed that the Ottomans had the, the highest quality um, and you know that at the time, the granulation of power before the invention of the bayonet was essentially the most important um, uh, firearm technology, um, and uh, the Ottomans were still excellent in, in, in that regard, and truly they had also adopted a lot of um, Western acquisitions uh, over time. Um, the Battle of the Rab is also underappreciated, I mean, I, I've met people that uh, call themselves Europeans and, and they have never heard of Count of the Holy Roman Empire, Raymond de Montecuccoli, and the Battle of uh, St. Gotthard, or the Rab River, whatever you, you, you want to call it, um, or Mogersdorf for that matter. Uh, there are various names. And uh, bad news, like if you think that you are European just because you're born on European soil, you're not, you cannot be European, first of all, for thinking it. Secondly, of course, not knowing your own history automatically doesn't make you European, um, which leaves a good 95% of people out um, of the count. But especially, you cannot be a fourth estator in being a European at the same time. 
right? So uh, knowing history is not a matter of, oh, I, I heard that name, so I will show off on the internet and saying, you know, I, I've heard that too, so I, I will, I hope that that's enough to be part of the group, right? If you don't have a solid, systemic, qualitative, historical knowledge, right, that doesn't make you hijacked by the first bullshit that you hear here and there, uh, just randomly and superstitiously pretending that maybe that's the right thing. Um, again, not European. As far as I'm concerned, I would actually expel you from it. And there are, I presume, you know, Islamic people who know European history better than me. So shame on you. Um, because, in fact, that is not a discriminant per se. Um, but there are, of course, other criteria still, so that don't think there is a free pass even just for knowing history well, because that's uh, just an important indicator, but not even close to the actual um, necessity. Um, in any case, as I was saying before, in 1664, um, as a large Islamic army tried again to go back towards the Alps, um, the imperial army uh, of Montecuccoli crushed this force between Austria and Hungary, essentially. Um, this saved literally the golden apple that Vienna represented. Uh, the clash ended, in fact, with a 20-year peace treaty between the Ottomans uh, and the Habsburgs. However, without extinguishing the, first of all, the Turkish ambitions, but the broader conflict that um, flared across the frontier between the two empires, that, as you know, was quite composite in nature. We talk a lot about Turkoli for, for that matter, uh, just to stick to closer events of 1683, but the Krajina, the, um, let's say, the, the fate of what had been Hungary, right? You know that royal, the Hungary had been split in three, as a matter of fact, at least in, in its original um, extension. One was Ottoman, one was a sort of proxy area, the other hegemonized by, by the Ottomans, the other was so-called Royal Hungary. And there were lots of attritions for the possession of this frontier, also because the Habsburgs and the Poles, that in 1683 uh, looked like, you know, uh, of course, best friends, of course, actually hated each other. Poland was trying to actually infiltrate the area, um, even asked as a matter of fact, um, the entire royal Hungary as a dowry from uh, Habsburgic princes that would have married his son, um, heir to the Polish throne. Um, so, as always, internationally, nobody really liked each other to the fullest. The Ottomans, from their side, had suffered a heavy blow at the Battle of the Rab, um, and they used uh, the long armed truce on the western borders to concentrate on the eastern ones. Uh, where there was this long-standing conflict with, with the Persians, as you know. Um, in between the peace and the 1683 campaign, of course, there was a lot of movement on the frontier. It was never quiet, right? And you could never tell, especially uh, from the uh, from the Austrian side, whether the, the Turks were ready for, for a major um, onslaught or it was just the rebel Hungarians harassing. Uh, the Habsburgic borders. Um, and this is a bit typical of uh, essentially of the scale of powers but also of their political and social um, uh, consistence, right? Um, Austria fit um, the broader Western, the narrowly meant Western, even though it was a, a, a central European reality, um, already those characteristics that would, that had saved Germany at the end of the day uh, in corner in terms of um, you know being a fully kind of elective system as opposed to um, a bit more uh, uh, dynastically hegemonic one because Germany was was huge and dramatically fragmented like as you know um, and uh, this was of course reflecting the as we've seen the the weakness actually of the Habsburgic dynasty but after all the Habsburgic lands had been built quite in exactly because of this federal character of Germany step by step place by place um, with much greater uh, refinement than instead the, the enormous immediate fast Ottoman conquests that eventually 
um, let the the Ottomans coping with all the, um, the kind of the difficulties that such uh, such enormous lands uh, pre presented being ruled. Um, so the Ottomans could, of course, they they ruled from from Ukraine to to Sudan, right? So they could mobilize. Um, in theory and practice, this enormous armies in, in a relatively uh, short amount of time. And it was particularly difficult to kind of even entering that system because it was so huge. Of course, it was full of spies and diplomats, whatever. But um, the Viennese intelligence was not so ready and quick to, to assess the threat that uh, in 1682 in 83 because the war was decided and the preparations started across in fact the two years um, was uh, to launch this enormous horde against their, their capital. In fact the Ottomans in 1682 having obtained peace in the east and without waiting for the expiry of the treaty with the Habsburgs um, began their preparations for a new attack on Vienna. That again, from an Ottoman perspective, was like um, like cost benefits uh, involved was the greatest objective they had. I mean, of, of course, the greatest is Rome, uh, obviously enough. But you know, campaigning in 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 the Adriatic with with Venice plus the the Italian interland, it, it, it's something nightmarish to say the least. There was again the option of Warsaw as the Ottomans were quite active in areas like, uh, say, Podoli, etc. There were a lot of Polish-Turkish wars, as you know, for preventing uh, the Turks to essentially go past the Carpathian chain and, um, and threatening, in fact, even this huge Polish-Lithuanian commonwealth that was, was very powerful, but even in that kind of more eastern guise by, by a degree... Um, parceled in this major mm, kind of principalities that the Slachta quite jealously preserved at the at the end of the day of, at the expenses of the monarchy and of the state and that's why you know in the following century Poland would become um, essentially a Russian vassal before being partitioned between Russia, Prussia and Austria and that's the price that you pay for not realizing the the, the potential that union has over fragmentation, right? Uh, we'll talk more about this Polish nature because politically and militarily it really uh, highlights the pros and cons of, of the system. Like there was no lack of good cause to relaun relaunch the conflict with the Habsburgs from Constantinople because Hungary, as we've seen, was half controlled by Austria and the rest was in the Turkish sphere of influence, at least, and it acted as a buffer between the Habsburgs and the, uh, the Ottomans in a way that was badly digested by um, by by Vienna. Uh, so, if if we look at the extension of the Empire, the Crescent, we see that Turkish aims um, had always been that grand in style, right? They became so, especially under Selim the First ruling between 1465 and 1520 as the Sultan established excellent relations with his western neighbors in particular with Venice and Hungary that knew perfectly well that it would have been next uh, a possible western onslaught of the Ottomans and that in fact were just at that point busy in the east and in Africa to the detriment of other Islamic states uh, once the, the Shia Persians were defeated in the famous Battle of Caldiran in 1514 um, and the borders extended to present-day Iraq, thus, Selim attacked the kingdom of the Mamluks that were also Turks, uh, at least culturally, uh, historically, conquering thus Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and together with them in Arabia, the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. Thus, in eight years, Salem had tripled his domains, creating an area of conflict with the West in the Mediterranean that, by the time of 1683, in fact, had not essentially 
um, diminished, in spite of all the the heavy blows that the empire had suffered, the Battle of Lepanto, the siege of Candia, um, that we'll have to look at because those are some of the most single most clamorous, um, uh, respectively, battle, uh, say, naval battle and siege in, in the history of mankind. And, you know, people still today kind of believe sometimes. I, I have experienced it. Like, a good part of the West doesn't even know what they, what these things actually were. Maybe, again, it's it's like Vienna. They know the name, but they don't actually understand what what these things did, right? The, the siege in Crete bled the Ottoman Empire white, right? And they still had resources to spend against Vienna. That gives you a proportion, a scale, as much as, as the Western maritime potential still from Mediterranean powers with Lepanto and, and more. Um, and in these uh, exploit at the beginning of the 16th century, the Ottomans had showed, by the way, to be hard Westerners in a way, because again, from actually a Western perspective, also the Ottoman military looks pretty exotic and is an average lighter. Uh, it has uh, lighter uh, cab lots of lighter cavalry, uh, lighter infantry. They essentially don't develop a pike and shot system. That's basically their only uh, weakness. Right? They don't have strong stopping infantry. They have assault infantry, we'll see better, also at work uh, in 1683 in the uh, in the breaches of, of Vienna with the Janissaries. They're in fact a very modern and advanced uh, corps that I also made diff different videos on and uh, as you know embody a little bit the um, the Sultanial arm in spite of the conflict that did exist even between the this the the Uranic uh, uh, Sultan and this essentially slaves thus canonic forces but they embodied thus the perfect um, hierarchical universal order with the the conquerors at the top and the slaves down um, but when we look, for example, already at artillery, well, the Ottomans, again, as we were saying before, uh, had actually topped gunpowder technology. Um, the Battle of Calderan is a dramatic display of actually Western firepower against essentially still uh, medieval Persian armies that based uh, their warfare on essentially heavy cavalry and horse archery and nothing else, a bit like, you know, still the Tartars did. Um, in insight before they were uh, they were cut down uh, hopelessly by the pike and shot of Timofievich, the, the Russian Pizarro. Um, so the world is changing and, and the Ottomans embody, if you want the best standards of this system, they have a huge uh, military influence uh, in Europe, especially in Central Europe. This is what we tend to overlook that uh, war is a great hybridizer of of peoples and cultures um, as much as their greatest potential de destroyer uh, by the way um, but um, the traumatic scale of sheer lack of any form of human mercy that existed on the Christian Ottoman frontier was also paralleled by some of the greatest honor respect and kind of admiration from both sides. I mean, if you visit Central Europe, all the beautiful armories, Schatzkammern, etc., of, of the, the German princes tell you how uh, literally obsessed um, Central European nobility was with everything Turkish um, and how it, it was of the greatest prestige, say, to, to, uh, to, to gift or to receive and gift uh, a full Ottoman panoply or things like this, even just by imitation, right? Of course, most of this began as with praise of war, as much as you can see very updated uh, Western European equipment in, in Ottoman uh, employ. Um, but that's the, the degree of giantism that this conflict uh, represents because again even if you can see the, the political fragmentation of Europe then you still see that there is a, a, a by a degree this a common spirit especially fueled by by Catholicism that was also in fact for what you would call geopolitical reasons uh, geopolitics does not exist little little spoiler but you know just the Catholic Catholic if you prefer countries were the, the closest right mainly again the Habsburgs Venice Poland these are the um, the squad 
but also of course a bit like especially at sea the, of the Italian powers the same Spanish monarchy um, and naturally an, an important um, Slavic frontier at some point was under the Ottomans uh, at some point wasn't but they were also orthodox as you know in some case Lutherans because they wanted to also avert the uh, uh, Catholic, uh, Catholic Habsburgic influence at some point some were Catholic instead too um, so when you look at this this picture of what what the Ottoman Empire was right you 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 realize that it, it basically preserved the holy places in, in, including Jerusalem by the way that the Christians were always in theory up to reconquering like I made a video about even I don't know the medicine crusader attempts. I mean, there were actual expeditions to recover Jerusalem from Tuscany. In, I don't know in, in in the full 17th century. Uh, of course, they wouldn't succeed, but again, it it was possible to threaten Constantinople. After all, again, the Ottoman Empire survived in the 19th century uh, up to the 20th because uh, you know just it was the Westerners that could have destroyed it immediately, but they didn't want either of, of all of them to prevail. Um, for obvious reasons. So the possibility of retaking Constantinople, and as Machiavelli said, look, once you decapitate the, the Ottoman Empire, given that it's so well centralized, it, you can take all, right? Instead, with the West, you can't quite do that, because, say, you can invade France, you can even kill the king, but you have all little uh, statelets within the state of these feudal lords that are radically entrenched in their own prerogatives and that also will fight to the death, just like another kinglet. Um, and will, you know, make it uh, an enormously costly enterprise to just undertake. Um, the Ottomans were the protectors of Islam, right? And as we will see with Kara Mustafa, this had a, a, a deep meaning because Christians and Muslims did hate each other, right? There, there was, in many places, um, in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, a coexistence between Christians and Muslims, but let's say the concept of modern tolerance did not exist like before um, the the second half of the 17th century. In fact, in in, in some of the most enlightened West, that some theories came about. There, there was no such thing like a coexistence dictated by, you know, these people are not heathens that will not burn in hell, right? This this was the actual belief um, that was pretty transversal. Um, but there was, in fact, enormous hatred for the entire political identity that religion embodied. Again, today we reason in terms of, again, Poland, Germany, Hungary, whatever. Uh, at the time, they would consider literally the Holy Roman Empire for what it literally means. Holy, in a Christian sense, Roman, because it was purely Roman. And Imperium, the God-given one. There is an Imperator, there is a Pope. Right, uh, there, there, there is the holy city of, of Catholicism. There is a, a universe of culture. Think about the Italian Renaissance, and that was at the top. Even in, as we'll see now, in military engineering, Vienna in those twenty years was pretty well defended by a Tras uh, Italien. It was built um, uh, for the occasion and saved the city um, in, in the second siege. Um, there was um, there was a culture, there was a, a knowledge, there was a science. Um, even Protestant Europe, as you know, was actually speeding dramatically, even surpassing uh, the Catholic one as far as especially science, uh, kind of more practical, kind of technological achievements also were were coming to place. There, there was colonialism. There was an intercontinental struggle. Think about the the clashes in the Indian Ocean b between the Ottomans and the Portuguese. So again, they were reasoning habitually that scale of power, right? So the prestige, it, and they, as such, they understood perfectly well how difficult it was to stretch this power further in pre-industrial times, which is something brutally difficult. Thus, Constantinople was here the leading counter of the entire Islamic universe you couldn't really tell where the ottoman empire stopped because yes in terms of direct control you can easily trace the, the map but you know the ottomans influence as far as southeast asia right and that was again part of a broader um ecumenic 
uh, Islamic fact, the Dar al Islam um, worldview that had made, in fact, up to Southeast Asia Islam progressing, uh, etc. And consider that in this time in history, during the early modern age, actually Islam beats Christianity uh, in conversion. Uh, even though the Christians conquered the Americas, so they began to lord over uh, a, a multitude of other peoples, Islam spreads like crazy uh, in Asia, in Africa, the latter especially being driven properly by the Ottomans. So Islam had still this expansive force that the Christians also legitimately felt threatened by. Remember always that the, the first formal purpose for which Columbus had opened the Americas to, to the uh, Spanish crown was, of course, the dream of surrounding the Muslims, both from west and east. That was the first objective declared as such, right? So uh, that's the mindset that you still have to uh, appreciate. It, it is true that the Ottomans were a bit less modern and secular than, than the Christian Europeans, but even in the latter world, the centrality of faith, of holy war, of this um, fanatically exalted pride of being literally part of the Christian Universal Empire is is radically represented, especially at the Battle of Vienna. As we were mentioning him before, Suleiman the Magnificent, ruling between 1494 and 1566, had transformed the empire into a real military power, conquering Budapest, Tripoli, Mesopotamia, so literally enlarging the, the wall system to uh, to Hungary, uh, Libya, the, the Persian Gulf, and above all, organizing the state apparatus in a very efficient and modern way for those time standards. Right, that's the peak of the Ottoman Empire in many ways. And yes, it is correct in a way to say that um, comparatively to our, other countries' achievements, uh, it's from that moment that the Ottomans begin gradually their descent, but uh, a dissent was, again, not to be determini deterministically intended, as we will see now. Let's look instead properly at the Christian side of the story here, because the Protestants and the other anti habsburgic components of Hungary, by 1682-83, uh, had coalesced, and also through substantial Ottoman aid, had recently won a precarious independence that the Austrians had quite badly digested. Sultan Mehmed IV ordered, these are the protagonists, Sultan Mehmed IV in Constantinople, Leopold I of Habsburg in Vienna, ordered the mobilization of his armies in January 1682. But the preparations took an enormous time because it was a huge force. Um, when um, the Sultan declared war on August the 6th. The season was already too late, and the invasion postponed until the following spring. Right? Remember that there is something celestially prophetic about this all, because the Halle Comet passed exactly in those years, and it was taken at the time as a, you know, um, a prediction of, of, of misfortune, of disasters, by, by the Christian side. And equally, you know, that was the question, what sign is this really, because eventually for the Christians it would turn out to be a clamorous victory for the Ottomans instead, a terrible defeat. So also from the Bosphorus, uh, the sky was being observed quite carefully. And remember that, uh, contrary to all those liberal myths that say, oh, you know, Christianity or, or monotheism destroyed all the knowledge that existed before. They destroyed astrology. I, I don't know how to tell you, but astrology was all over the place here. Uh, it, there were even properly court astrologers. This, this is these are this is the great center of alchemy, um, of kind of still a magic, exoteric view of the world. Again. Uh, there was, as we've seen, not perhaps an optimal orthodox standard, but astrology was part, again, of the hierarchy of knowledge, per se, and yes, they, you know, it was pretty normal, right? It, it, that's a side of the story from the Middle Ages, the terrible Christians arrive and destroy astrology. It's not true, 
as a matter of fact. It's actually one of the most ignorant statements you can make if you know anything about the same history of religions, if you have even banally read a medieval chronicle. Um, the Turkish forces, however, were immense, so nothing would say it was such a huge effort that everybody was pretty convinced that Vienna was doomed, or at least that uh, now it was the Christian turn to put up um, a resistance and to gather, however, enough uh, troops because the Habsburgs alone, of course, didn't have enough uh, forces, right? Not even calling the all the other princes of the empire that, in theory, they were subjected to them. So we will see this better in a more detailed video, but the Ottoman army varied in size between 100 and 300 thousand men held together by massive logistic apparatus I mean even if you count them uh, at the minimum um, it was still like a gigantic effort that was essentially sucking all the resources uh, of the Empire in this one shot investment so that gives you also by political and strategic scale the magnitude of this of this effort and how strong the conviction uh, from the Ottoman side was about this. Um, we know very few about what, wh how the whole thing was decided politically. Uh, in fact, uh, we are also m more approximative about the, the Ottoman numbers because the Ottoman Empire didn't produce the, the same type of kind of advanced modern secular historiography that the West had, so we are much better documented. It was probably a very different political and social structure um, it was much more productive in the West for us to even know these things, like about the numbers um, of the men, the logistical systems, and so on. For for the Turks, it's a bit more of a mystery. But the the substance, also what we can reconstruct from from the Western side, from the military accounts, etc., from a tactical and strategic point of view, speaks for itself. Yes, this was a huge army uh, that was surely carefully balanced by the Ottomans to fit the purpose because they had literally to reach the northernmost frontier. It was dramatically um, stretched uh, and so never think that uh, Goliath per se is stronger than David as just the same biblical myth tells us. Well, the delay that we have seen between 1682 and 1683 proved invaluable to Emperor Leopold I. What the time had to gain allies to his cause. Telling the truth, as we were saying before, the Habsburgs underestimated still the Ottomans in this uh, till the last months said, well, yeah, maybe they are doing this, but we don't know it yet. There was a dramatic um, fracture within the Habsburgic court. It was so the, the so-called Spanish uh, party, the so-called uh, German party, um, uh, it, it was a mess. I made multiple videos to explain diplomatically how the thing unfolded. Um, even on this side, we don't know literally everything, but um, it was always the same problem in a way, because as we will see now, everything was coordinated more or less with France, I mean with the Ottomans, um, because uh, there was um, you know, a sp the, the so-called Spanish faction that wanted to weaken the Ottomans, mostly to procure less Mediterranean pressure, whereas, and so investing actually in, in Eastern Europe um, towards, in fact, towards the Empire, towards the Balkans, as a matter of fact. And then the other one that instead looked more at the interests of the Empire, per s at least in, in a territorial sense, and saying, look, the French are invading the Rhineland. They are uh, essentially uh, eating parts of of Western Germany and permanently integrating it with France, so this is uh, a huge loss in prestige and we have to do something about it uh, and this means diverting troops from the eastern border and uh, employing them on the western one. So in all this, this there is Polish pressure, there are different factions even in the same uh, in the same central Europe on this vassals either of, of the Habsburgs or of the Ottomans uh, the, the Pope in Rome, as we'll see now, has a, a, a brutally radical decisiveness in all this because if it hadn't been for Papal Mone, the uh, league that defeated the Turks at the gates of Vienna would have not existed. Vienna would have fallen. 
the papal diplomatic effort was relentless as effective. It was uh, a hell of a masterpiece. Um, and it's exactly also thanks to the bold time, as we've seen, that uh, the Vatican could, could make it. In fact, Leopold I, that passes for a bit of a, you know, say introverted person with lots of, is a typical 17th century sovereign um, uh, torn apart by uh, spiritual struggles and, you know, influenced in this sense by his, his spiritual um, uh, advisor was in fact supported by the tireless diplomatic work of the Capuchin friar Marco D'Aviano uh, that, uh, you know, as you know, in Vienna is, is present in, in statues in, because it, it, was the, the sp it was properly elected as the spirit of, of the crusade for how it was handled, even under the pressure of the Ottoman Oslo, because uh, the, the army that was gathered to, to attack the Ottomans was really making it in time. The, the, the city was about to fall, right, and it was all extremely risky. And even in those moments, still, there were quarrels between the emperor and the king of Poland because the latter wanted to be in charge of the army and it seemed bad for that the Holy Roman Emperor would, that literally has to be an emperor, so commanding armies by, by uh, existential reason <laughs> just be put aside. So there was uh, an incredible patience, in fact, a friar's patience, you could say, that uh, would manage to fix this all. Um, uh, Marco D'Aviano was an envoy, naturally, of Pope Innocent XI. Um, and this um, friar um, visited, essentially, the European courts to form th the new Holy Christian League. There were lots of other uh, nunci in, um, all over Europe, uh, especially the, the one in, um, in Warsaw was very important. In Italy, um, Cardinal Siba was, was very important as well. Um, and the major problem here was also trying to convince France, um, uh, if not to send troops to help uh, the Habsburg, at least not to uh, support the Ottomans, as a matter of fact, because that's literally what, what was happening. In fact, um, it, was, it had been cause of embarrassment uh, uh, for the French Ottoman relations, that during the siege of Candia, some mm, cocky f French aristocrats had gone to Crete to get literally massacred, still in that kind of lace than tell way, the pure, uh, you know, bad assert, but with that kind of bloodshed um, uh, result, uh, and thus. Uh, making the sublime gate telling to Paris like well, what the hell are you doing right we are supposed to be allied in this context of course the France of Louis the fourteenth uh, didn't like the Ottomans more than anybody else right? not even uh, an English or, or or a Saxon necessarily like the Turks but um, and differently from the Protestants the Sun King was also a Catholic sovereign and uh, he he was fighting of course for a further affirmation of uh, Catholicism, um, mostly mostly in France rather than in Germany. Actually, when he, he was invading, because there he would actually receive support of of the Protestants paradoxically. Um, but uh, of course, realized that uh, even if Vienna had fallen, uh, France would have still uh, earned a lot of power. Would have uh, truly. Um, achieved an hegemonic status in Europe would have probably had had to lead the struggle against the Ottomans afterwards. This is exactly what the Saint Francis the First was thinking in 1529 when the Ottomans were threatening Vienna or just <coughs> have an Italian invasion or something. The French would have been next, but the power of France as a state would have emerged um, enormously, and um, this was only partly anti-traditional because the the hegemonic project of France were uh, imperial in nature. I made mean, even a bit of, uh, a bit about the imperial essence of the French monarchy historically since ever, and that was in fact a bit like the true empire in Europe as opposed to at least Habsburgic Austrian. Even you know the Habsburgic Spaniards were 
yes, they, they were hegemonic in other ways, but uh, not really to supplant the, the, the major land power of, of France, um, per se. Uh, the, the enormous agricultural demographic resources, um, and especially now under Louis XIV, that, as we have seen, literally created the first national modern army uh, from which all the, the military standards of Europe eventually followed to, to this day in, in, in many aspects still used. Um, if Vienna had fallen the French could have easily hegemonized Germany um, as the Habsburgs still had a capability to intervene in favor of their western subjects some degree, at least backing them in the case they, they opposed the French. But as, as we've seen, some Protestants even preferred the French in Germany than supporting the Catholic Habsburgs. Marco Daviano is crucial here because he instead managed to obtain the support of the King of Poland, Jan III Sobieski. Now, Poland was, wasn't faring tremendously well um, in, in absolute terms. Of course, Jan Sobieski was one of the greatest uh, um, kings uh, in, in Polish history, but the Commonwealth had entered um, essentially a French orbit. The Saint Jan had been elected thanks to the French support. Um, the country was, as we've seen, very difficult to rule because the Schlachta, as essentially most central in, in most Central European monarchies, had um, aborted the attempt of um, centralization instead was taking place in Western Europe and so had condemned a bit like um, a bit like Germany, a bit like Hungary, it was in fact Bohemia uh, the local countries to rely just on the nobility and that would avert uh, any attempt of centralization, at least the ones from which they could not benefit in a more kind of autonomistic sense uh, but the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth were still a, a, a might to be reckoned especially from a military point of view. Um, we will talk more now about the Polish military, but I made lots of videos about it uh, also through this period. Um, and the, the enterprise was of enormous significance for two reasons. Firstly, because there was, as we've seen, bad blood between the sovereigns of Poland and Austria, so diplomatically it was great success. Secondly, because Sobieski exactly could field one of the major military powers of the time. But time, exactly, this is the point, this was running out as the Ottomans were approaching. And even moving, coordinating all the various scattered Christian forces was quite complicated. And I would uh, stop reflecting for, for a moment on the value of the Eastern-Western perspective in this all, because if you look at the coat of arms of the same Vienna, you will see the imperial symbol of the double-headed eagle that was inherited from Constantinople, mm -hmm. uh, was also known uh, in the steppes, um, it was used by say also the Seljuks back in the day, um, uh, the Viennese coat of arms has inverted colors because it's gold on black um, as opposed to the to the Byzantine one, but what matters is really the symbol of an empire that looks both east and west, that um, Vienna really represents in many ways. Um, in the 17th century, alongside the Ottoman danger, the Habsburgs had to face, as we've seen, also the one represented by Louis XIV, the Sun King, the most powerful uh, ruler of, of, uh, in Europe at the time, um, and his aims on German territories. And this East and West, as we will see now, especially from a military point of view, recurs so much. Vienna opens to this great, um, it's difficult to call it per se Eastern European, but it's something culturally different, right, from, from Germany, right? Even when we encompass this whole area as Central Europe, there are still some subdivisions within it. Um, as we will see, the same Poland, it's the Sarmatism of its nobility, the the enormous uh, longitudinal extension of the Commonwealth uh, that had literally re-easternized the Polish army that by the end of the Middle Ages was essentially a, um, un undistinguishable from from the rest of of Western Europe um, 
uh, must make us reflect of what, first of all, the Ottoman Empire had been, uh, had been able to accomplish. So basically, gemonizing uh, large parts of even of Central and Eastern Europe, just even through the threat of its military intervention, the fact that even the, the Tartars of Crimea uh, that had been somehow venerated by the Ottomans as the heirs of, of the Oceanic Empire of King Khan had fundamentally become Ottoman vassals. Um, the, the enormous influence that the, the Ottoman Empire had had on the same steps in catalyzing the efforts uh, uh, for example, these various nomadic populations could join in the Ottoman raids in, in Central Europe uh, with great distress of the local populations um, in, uh, in a relatively unprecedented fashion because uh, the, the area had always been somehow a frontier between the, the sedentary and the nomadic world, but the Ottomans were using uh, their resources with um, a scientific method in fact, when on April the 1st, 1683, the Ottoman army finally began to slow the, the march towards Vienna, it was preceded by an avant-garde of 40,000 Tartar horsemen, with the task of keeping the moves of the Habsburg army under control, a bit like the Antemne of the Turkish um, force, but also terrorizing the local population. And the Tartars carried out the task with particular diligence, because... Traditionally, their pay consisted exclusively in loot, right? So, um, the objective of... This was typical of the Ottoman armies. They were literally and scenographically embodying this brutal core of highly drilled um, troops, such as the Janissaries or the, um, or the sea pies. So, even they're mixing modernity with tradition but being literally literally floating on a swarm of locusts that the tartars were so all around the the army way was paid by the advance of these raiders that literally could keep uh, a, a, an important distance between the ottoman army and the enemy one in time for uh, letting the command decide what what a strategic uh, decision to take and in, in the meanwhile foraging so laying waste but obviously in a way that would reinforce the main army not you know scorching the earth the same earth they would have had to cross per se um, and of course raiding also may, carrying out the same um, strategy around the the enemy arm and already we're talking about 40,000 Tartars that had come from basically all Eastern Europe, even more far away, because uh, as as soon as news that the Ottoman army was moving, people from from all places would come to in for for the loot. And the Christian army, led by the Duke Charles V of Lorraine, because these are were the forces that had been gathered so far under imperial command, could do little, because this force was essentially uh, neither uh, a half of the enemy vanguard alone. So they withdrew. Mm -hmm. And this essentially, um, of course, it was a strategic purpose in testing this first uh, advance in, in um, you know, at a distance, but still in open field. And having assessed on the ground what the situation was, well, the uh, strategy became a dictat. There was no other way to defend Vienna, but entrenching in the city and awaiting for greater reinforcements from, again, hopefully, the rest of Christian Europe. Consider that in all this, during the siege, Emperor Leopold resided in Passau. Interestingly enough, he had uh, withdrawn from Vienna uh, uh, somehow late, and uh, while he was ri rising up uh, the, uh, the, the Danube, um, on on its uh, left bank, uh, from on the other one, a Tartar detachment was spotted, and it was just thanks to the French ambassador in Vienna that everybody hated because Louis XIV hadn't sent help. But the guy was a decent man, an old nobleman, etc. Actually, blockaded a bridge with his um, with his coach, and together with his serfs, he put up a resistance and managed to 
to to make the the imperial family uh, reach uh, safety in time because that's how um, capillary right and uh, in depth the the tartar permeating cap capability of the enemy territory even with literally a, a, an army around where it really was because how do you intervene with them consider this man literally live out in the wilderness of the steppes so first of all um, for them killing or getting killed not a big deal right you know it's a normal thing that happens in everyday life uh, but secondly there are all like handful pockets of troops um, so you cannot quite concentrate any meaningful force against them if not being worn out because the guys are better at that kind of hit and run tactics skirmishing raiding and in the meanwhile of course uh, pillaging raping cutting to pieces probably also eating people um, and I'm not kidding um, these things did happen you know roasting people alive was absolutely normal on the Christian Ottoman frontier as much as impaling them as you know uh, from both sides by the way that's quite fascinating um, and from from Passau Leopold was just like he, he was stunned right he or better Marco Daviano was actually trying to involve as many Christian countries as possible in the crusade against the Turkish invader right the imperial family was praying was it was a terrifying uh, situation because you have to imagine in in this event well the, the, the Ottoman army approached Vienna that literally Germany was overflowed with refugees um, from everywhere there were all these columns of, of people that they didn't know what to do because uh, literally that the Ottoman tide which was swarming all over and whoever was found in between like was was practically if even if surviving was despoiled of any of any resource that the Ottoman army needed to sustain itself in enemy territory um, that's when, by the way, um, Leopold had entrusted he, the, the command of the, uh, of the imperial army to his brother-in-law, Duke Charles V of Lorraine. Um, so the, the siege began, to make the long story short, so the, the risk materialized literally in front of the city. Um, Vienna would be defended by the Count Ernst von Starnberg, Badly assisted by the uh, Burgmeister Liebenberg. 11,000 soldiers only, plus 5,000 citizens with 300 cannons that would have had to resist at any cost to give uh, time for help to arrive. Consider the numbers here. So we will see now what, um, what um, Viennese uh, defenses consisted in, but uh, you understand that uh, you're just leaving initiative to the enemy. You can't do much else in a, a counter-offensive way. And you have just to hold against an army that is basically at least ten times yours. Uh, and with the some of the finest equipment there, even though uh, the, the truly heavy ar artillery wasn't there, partly also for logistical reasons, because again, the Ottomans were so far from their bases, um, what the Viennese were awaiting as aid was a mosaic of forces which included, in addition to the Habsburg cavalry, uh, remaining outside the walls to maneuver, so not assisting them, uh, in, um, I mean directly, plus of course coordinating with them, but still remaining out for seizing any opportunity. And the aforementioned Polish army that was seemingly finally arriving, soldiers from the major German states and even from the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, as well as numerous volunteers. This is an important aspect of the story. Um, as we were saying before, um, the nobility of Europe, especially of Central Europe, was, was exalted by this event. I mean, even Protestant kids wanted to go fight. Um, for the the Habsburgs, uh, there weren't so many because their fathers as princes, as Protestant princes, wouldn't actually let them, most cases. But it's again, these people were radically obsessed with the deeds that they had listened were happening against the Turk in this holy enterprise against the heathens. You have there, of course, most of them were Catholic. We mentioned before Prince Eugene um, of Savoy 
uh, Carignan who joined without basically any money, right? He just joined this band of literally a, uh, a European uh, noble youth uh, that didn't have uh, many means uh, per se, but they just wanted to fight in the end, and the thing was crude. Um, as we will see, Prince Eugene would have actually a uh, a role even in the combat in Vienna. I mean, not a meaningful one, but he, it would be his first blood, by the way, very interestingly, considering the future of the man. Um, there were thus mostly also lots of other uh, made men who uh, were quite accomplished princes of the empire, had all the interest, of course, for the Habsburgs to, uh, to resist. As we have seen here, from the well, Holy Roman Empire, you have even the, the Italian states. You have numerous volunteers. This is an interesting aspect. Even commoners, um, from especially the areas that had fought the most against the, the Turks, per se, um, and or that realized, however, how serious the situation really was. Of course, great part of the reason why the Poles intervened uh, while we find even Italian volunteers and um, and of course mostly Germans altogether, because it was that these were the peoples that would have been exposed more directly to the direct Ottoman um, threat if uh, Vienna had fallen. And and it's also the social composition that strikes you, because um, it tells you how much even the common person felt this this event. We will see better what the tactics of the Battle of Vienna were uh, in a while, but just to make you understand, of course, uh, Western troops at this point were mostly about uh, pike and shot, right? More shot at this point than pike, because the latter was falling um, out of use, especially this, you know, the counter march, all, all these means to, uh, to properly deliver several, uh, say, volleys in sequence, etc., had already been showed there with great skill, for example, at the aforementioned battle, the Rab were literally, even there, the Christians were outnumbered, the Ottomans crossed the Rab, and it's this very well calibrated um, use of the of, of, of the wings with, with the center cavalry charges and, and um, orderly volleys that manages to contain the Ottoman multitude and eventually making it collapse even though the same Christian line was really so um, Europe was going toward that direction so mostly infantry cavalry actually was coming back on the battlefields from from a while now because the, the moment of greatest contraction had been towards the mid 16th century um, now probably shock cavalry was there I mean cavalry is always shock based but let's say um, this had been reinforced consistently over time, especially in Central Europe, in Eastern Europe. Of course, we'll talk about the most beautiful clamors and actually effective exception of the, of the Polish Hussars. Um, there was a much greater emphasis still probably on cavalry clashes. Um, the, the, the Europeans had a very high opinion of the, the Ottoman Sipais, right? Uh, and uh, generally speaking, these were considered, in, uh, from an individual point of view, it's always the same story that individually, you know, the, the, you, you can be greater, but let's say in, in collectively you may fall short of expectations in this regard, because um, now the, the orderly volleys of, of Christian infantry were getting ever more methodically effective against the bit more feudal, essentially, Ottoman army. So, it was a moment of brutal uh, warfare as always, but uh, rendered ever more punching and powerful and, and bloody uh, in the interest of time. On July the 14th, the Ottomans were in sight of Vienna, um, or rather what was left of it, because the day before the Viennese had set fire to the buildings outside the city walls, the suburbs, to allow a, a, a wider field of fire for their own artillery. And the city defenses, uh, although incomplete, were modern, and inspired by the new rules dictated by the Italian military architects according to the principles of the Bastion Track, 
a masonry path bristling with arrowhead offshoots to facilitate the shooting of their cannons and making an effective the opposing one. Right, the Vauban system was already being experimented at this point, but the Trace uh, Italian dominated still. So th the the concept was pretty uh, simple. Uh, we we have just illustrated it. You have cannons at the bottom of these essentially uh, corners, um, with instead this arrowhead uh, protrusions. In fact, that um, from from the side of the enemy that is tendentially just in front of the of the ray going towards the center of the fortification is uh, is to be shot mostly towards the point and not the side, right? So minimizing the effect of, of cannons, the profile is always uh, shorter and uh, the, the fortification is always deeper, right, in um, uh, extensionally. Um, so the, the, the Viennese bastions had uh, not been completed but naturally there were as always like in the past other ways to to fortify contingently the areas that were probably not bastioned yet of course the suburbs had not been destroyed before any any any, any army would uh, reach vienna um that had been the case um instead um and if you go to vienna you know there are plagues properly telling you look here i remember you know i, I got a hotel there probably it was just outside uh, the, the historical scene you see here is where the Ottoman camp stood and it, it's beautiful because eventually uh, the bastions do not practically exist anymore they were torn down in the 19th century um, but we know pretty well from maps etc of how the whole thing was also archaeologically there are still remains and it's all very, very fascinating to see from from the place it, it's very different of course from what it looked at the time but always remember that the city for what it is today is a consequence of that clamorous victory will happen in those very places for that matter there are many other places around vienna by the way that are very interesting to visit the aforementioned petronel carnuntum when the brother of prince eugene was killed and after he came back for from belgrade in 1717 um, there was at least the the song the, the famous prince eugen that says how prince eugene stopped to render homage to his brother's um, tomb after having scored this dramatic victory against the Ottomans, that we will perhaps talk uh, about uh, soon. Um, but there were many other places along the Danube that so pretty intense uh, warfare, because there are other, for example, Tabor, um, very, very important bridges on the Danube, as you understand, that had strategic relevance. And today we don't have the time just to descend uh, in the details, all right? But we will talk about them too in the aforementioned series. Um, along the way, well, the, from from Trace, the Sultan has stopped in Belgrade. That is the key on on the Danube that eventually opens to the Hungarian plain, um, with his enormous baggage, by the way, uh, two hundred wagons only for the harem. Interestingly enough. Um, but stopping there, as uh, Mehmed left the absolute command in the hands of the Grand Vizier Kara Mustafa. Kara Mustafa hated Christians. He was a great uh, politician, a very shrewd, energic and ambitious ruler. It seems that it was fundamentally his um, decision, rather than the Sultan's, um, um, everything considered, to have decided the 1683 campaign naturally the prestige deriving from the eventual fall of, of Vienna would have been enormous for Mustafa that paid um, as we will see for probably also some kind of mm, you know choice that in the way at least he led the siege that perhaps he thought could have uh, that was lengthened um, perhaps in a too cautious way, the same one that would be exploited militarily by, by the Allies, and that perhaps was aiming at forcing the enemy to negotiate, and, and thus uh, the, the surrender of Vienna, and thus providing with this enormous, enormous prestige to, to his own person, and we don't know perhaps exactly what uh, what, it, what was the factor that counted the most, but we know eventually how the thing ended. Now, the Ottomans were quite methodic in the siege. The artillery accompanying the army was of medium or light type, which was actually insufficient to demolish the Viennese walls. 
uh, per se. So it was immediately clear to Kara Mustafa that the battle would have to be long and exhausting, um, and that the sappers would play the main role there. And the Ottoman army had, however, a, a long experience of sieges. We have remembered it before. The Ottomans had conquered essentially the, the entire eastern Mediterranean. So there were lots of um, great fortresses, even think about uh, the siege of Famagusta or uh, even the failed one in Malta, but um, uh, we've seen the one in of Kandy, etc. So um, this rocky coastal Mediterranean reality that entails per se just to the development of a massive logistical um, apparatus because you have to transport everything also by sea um, it's um, the, the, the ground is particularly tough uh, had never scared the Ottomans that uh, could boast this in fact impressive curriculum of siege warfare of uh, military engineering as we've seen gunpowder technological development uh, logistical capacity um, I mean, the Balkan interland hadn't been easier to conquer there with all those mountains. So, the Turkish army was actually pretty well prepared to that. It's mostly the strategy here that uh, makes us wonder, you know, what was the aim and the, the timing and how Kara Mustafa saw the world thing, also in connection with the political objective. Because, um, again, the method was quite simple. Having identified the most vulnerable section of the walls, the Janissaries encamped in front of it and immediately began to approach work that was a series of serpentine trenches called parallels which would have allowed the, pro uh, the protected assault on the city. Uh, the concept there, as you know, is quite simple. It's essentially uh, avoiding enfilade fire if you make this kind of zigzag um, in front of the... Uh, in front of the enemy lines, you just curve that uh, very extreme and then you you just are protected by the trench that more or less runs by approximation almost parallel um, to the to the enemy um, to the enemy bastions even considering there is this kind of uh, star um, plan um, you can approach without uh, too many too many losses right um, that's actually how uh, D'Artagnan at the siege of Maastricht um, in the same period died. But, um, you know, there is nothing devoid of risk for that matter. Um, in, in just two weeks, the Turks, by the way, had reached the Viennese outer moat. But their mines had already been ready for a few days as tunnels were dug to make the gunpowder shine under the foundations of the walls. The first explosions occurred on July the 23rd and others followed day after day. There's a lot of psychological warfare going on. In August, the fighting took, especially on a ruthless, methodical pace. Tur Turkish guns shelled in the morning, mines were blasted in the evening, and assaults launched at night. This is basically the same Stoßtruppen tactic during World War I. Also because warfare literally never changes. Um, and uh, it's the same concept. You basically weaken the, the enemy positions with a, with a constant bombardment. Then you blow up uh, mines to essentially make crumble the already shattered um, positions. And you launch an attack, especially at night when the enemy can't quite see what's going on. Um, and the thing repeated over and over and over again. And, and the pressure was, um, was terrifying. But the defenders of Vienna, too, had organized themselves efficiently. Companies of citizens divided by corporations operated alongside the military. And there was no lack of contribution from women who distinguished themselves in the excavation of trenches. There are pretty sorrowful pages um, uh, you know, written about the, the misery um, of life uh, within within Vienna, but don't think that outside things were were that better. Um, the, the prolongation of the fight severely tested the Viennese, especially the ranks thinned and the century wasted their strength. Foot naturally was um, running out after an initial phase in which sorties were attempted 
uh, even the defenders began to follow a repetitive pattern. The breaches were closed with makeshift barricades, and there the Turkish attack was awaited, which, along being uh, repulsed each time, caused a high cost in human lives from both sides, proportionately, because um, the Turks could send this uh, waves of 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 soldiers en masse, and naturally suffering lots of casualties, but you know testing more the the, the enemy, because um, f from in fact the defender side. Uh, morale w w was, uh, let's say, higher as much as it was triggered by this pressure, but on the long run, it was, of course, um, hitting at the at the root also of the the endurance, the the, uh, the stamina, and uh, even a few losses from the BNA side were still high comparatively to to the numerical disproportion between the two forces. Um, you have to imagine all this like the the landscape of Vienna um, uh, shrouded in in smokes um, in um, you know you you could hear the the prayers uh, and or the, from both sides right? from 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 the Christian city or from the from the Ottoman camp and um, the the situation was pretty dire for for everybody involved but the Ottomans had the advantage, and the first fruits of the methodical siege tactics were were seen in early September when more powerful mines than the usual knocked down large portions of the Viennese bastions, among whose ruins the Turks settled. So they basically had one foot already in the city, right? And victory seemed a matter of days. That's the most critical moment. Uh, the Viennese were um, ready now to to await the Ottomans literally in the city streets, and it would have been like a carnage. But then entering in the city and mass would have conferred the Ottomans an overwhelming superiority, and resistance would have um, surely been uh, repressed uh, in in a short time. However, as we have seen, even in the Ottoman camp, the price was paid for an exhausting siege. Kara Mustafa's prudence was not shared by his troops, especially as it concealed a great rashness. All the manpower was employed to accelerate the progress of the siege works, leaving the huge camp practically undefended. Um, the Ottomans had realized this, right, and at the same time, um, it seemed that for having invested so much in the, um, in fact, in in the assault, in the city assaults, uh, there there was a, a bit of uh, wavering from Mustafa's side to, to launch a, a major onslaught that could force and break. Everything was delicately balanced, so again, it's difficult to express an assessment, but never underestimate this political ambition of Mustafa to to claim Vienna without. Um, too much of a of a bloodshed, not risking uh, even defeat, maybe in the assault, right? So just letting time wearing out the garrison. But there was not just the garrison, and not only. While the Christian reinforcements were gathering close to Vienna, the Ottoman army didn't seem prepared at all to meet with this relieving force. By September the 7th, the armies of the Holy League had now gathered a few kilometers from the city, ready to intervene to wrest it from the Ottoman siege. Jan Sobieski, king of Poland, had led his men in an extraordinary forced march, covering the 320 kilometers that separated him from Vienna in just 12 days. Um, this speaks, by the way, of also the the logistical capacity and the military discipline of the Polish forces. Furthermore, the screen offered by the Tatar warriors no longer worked properly uh, for the Ottomans, and actually most of the nomads had abandoned the war due to serious disagreements with Kara Mustafa. Because they had also realized that the enemy was uh, approaching en masse and their light cavalry essentially could, yes, try to, 
to wear them out to slow down their their advance but they didn't have the the consistency for as light cavalry by definition cannot oppose the heavy troops um, and this conflicted as we've seen with Mustafa's strategy was instead more narrowly bottled in the trenches in front and the bridges in Vienna's gates plus the Tartars were just unreliable on their own right now that they had looted and you know were somehow satisfied they didn't have even too much reason to get themselves killed for you know Constantinople when they I don't know inhabited somewhere in, you know in um, in today's Russia or Kazakhstan or whatever now a special mention must be done for for the army of the Holy League at this point because um, um, the forces that had been put together, as we will see now, were 3,000 so-called winged hussars, plus other 27,000, some 48 guns, if I'm not wrong. The Germans were 47,000. Regarding the wings, somebody told me, but look, you know, there is not really um, much of an evidence of this. First of all, how not? And secondly, even if there wasn't, like, are you kidding me? Like, first of all, they're represented everywhere. But secondly, um, they were uh, pretty famous, like, in, since the migration era and before, you know, armies pretty much everywhere in Eastern Europe, in the Balkans, ev all the areas bordered by the steppes military culture. Now, the, the Polish army at this point was a very uh, refined military machine and an anachronism of success uh, depending on how it very o often happens in, in the history of civilization being essentially a mix between traditionalism and modernity as we were saying before the, the polish lithuanian commonwealth was pretty big powerful and most of its uh, bases laid in fact on nobiliar power that had managed to remain to, to preserve it its own prerogatives against the attempts of monarchic centralization that had made the Polish Schlachta cultivate, um, in fact, a cult of themselves that had uh, even transfigured their ethnic cultural origins. Uh, you have probably heard of Sarmatism, so the idea that the Polish nobility thought at that point that they were uh, the, gr the descendants of the great conquerors of the steppes surely they had been very um, charmed by the, um, the kind of the, the Mongol uh, political um, model again of an, an unhinged kind of um, rule over the uh, over commu of the community in general right to a Polish magnate a peasant was you know even less than a non-human being. I mean, it's something that properly projected this man on 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 in the heavens just out of the sheer kind of militaristic lifestyle. That again, just look at what kind of weapons these people wielded. I mean, um, you know, they, they were exclusively uh, as all the military cases designed to slaughter large masses of human being as a living, as by profession, and um, just uh, again the. Um, the see the, the the poles, though especially in times of the uh, renaissance of classical suggestions, uh, Poland was also civilized in in, in comparison to say uh, Russia, for example. Uh, the renaissance uh, had um, been felt. French Italian culture had always kind of um, permeated Poland, uh, uh, especially thanks to the to the great connection, in fact, with the papacy, the unwavering uh, Catholicism. Of, of the Poles, especially again guided in the struggle against the Ottomans that Poland had led, um, etc. But properly, uh, the Schlachta had matured the idea that they descended from the great Sarmatian leaders of the steppes that had thus come and conquered as um, major equestrian overlords um, the the populations again of Central Europe and that they had founded their their feudal dynastic. Uh, nobility or in quasi royal or imperial even rights as in fact sole rulers in their own uh, estates um, and um, this naturally was cultivated through that sheer military practice the expansion that uh, Poland especially with the further union 
with Lithuania, the second half of the 16th century had shifted the, uh, in fact, the Polish frontier as far as uh, Russia practically, um, given that at some point they even marched on, on Moscow. But the, um, the, the process had caused, from a military point of view, a very interesting hybrid. As we were saying before, late medieval Poland had basically uh, the same identical profile of, say, a, a German army. Right, they the Poles fought not only with pike shot infantry, they had um, men at arms in, in Gothic armor, artillery, um, etc. A, a bit less in, in uh, scale, in quality, perhaps, than the most updated Western uh, countries. This is true, but the model was perfectly Western. After the six, the, the, the late 16th century, instead, there is a re Westernization because of this massive political and strategic needs to keep at bay the, the huge, the based uh, eastern frontier, basically it's Ukraine, um, and but beyond even because they had Lithuania, they had parts of Russia, even uh, very far, etc. They, they, it was an enormous power for that matter. And the magnates naturally had been subcontracted an important part of the army. That's also how essentially a royal army ha uh, had been created. It was a core of even kind of external forces, mercenaries, uh, even brought from countries like Hungary, even the same concept of Usar actually comes from 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 there. But the worst kind of French guards, uh, German troops, um, uh, even as foreign mercenaries, not only the the German cities that were uh, ruled by by the Commonwealth, uh, even Janissaries. At some point, there was a unit of Janissaries that, that was copied by the Polish king, again, and I made videos about this too. But definitely, the major feature of the Polish um, army, per se, were these hussars, right? That were actually heavy cavalry, there were various degrees. The, also of other kind of lesser armored cavalry, then there were lots of, there were also dragoons developed at, at this time um, that had, um, uh, there were also like pioneers, etc. They had a, a greater um, horse bias than the other Western dragoons that were somehow also more expandable on foot, uh, because the East was was cavalry, and actually, famously enough, the the Poles themselves had mobilized an enormous amount of Tartar population. Some of them historically had been settled in Poland, probably as military colonies, um, etc. But the ultra elite that was the backbone of the Polish army was represented by this heavy cavalry that is quite picturesquely represented, perhaps the most famous cavalry at least um, as a, in this kind of, with this ethnic flavor um, in, in the military annals, that had, first of all, because of this, the sheer uh, stratification of, of Polish society, in fact, it, it embodied the ultra elite. So these were extremely expensive knights, just the magnates could feel the, the sovereign actually had participated to this because uh, the lances were built in very special um, wood that was somehow standardized and managed by the crown. This kind of more attempt of centralistic redistribution for having a control also on these private armies. Um, and they fought literally in the best. Um, that point was. Uh, in fact, anachronistic, at least by the standards of a medieval tradition, that, however, was topped, right, to, to the best thickly packed um, formation, um, array, uh, couché, lance, grip, shock, charge, in ways that, especially the lance, it was particularly long, could even uh, afford to charge frontally. Pike meant formation. Right. Th this is what, for example, Gustavus Adolphus learned the hard way fighting against the Poles with his infantry, and that's why he also began to, to increase firearm power as opposed to the pikes, and also developing kind of bit re injecting a bit of more of uh, melee cavalry in, in the system and trying to, to mobilize, etc., because he had been fighting against these magnificent knights um, that, of course, preferably would, wouldn't charge. Um, enemy pikemen frontally, because that's how the entire thing that uh, the pike had been designed to uh, to do, like killing knights for that matter, but it, it did happen on some occasions, differently from 
from from the rest of Western cavalry. And the Poles had maintained, and, and they were also quite agile and speedy and kind of overwhelming. And there were some victories scored against the Ottomans in Eastern Europe, where literally you have things like victories of 1 to 10, like massive bats of blood, these knights literally running over a, an endless, um, you know, uh, carpet of, of Ottoman soldiers and their subject was just ran over, cut to pieces as I was saying before, just look at the uh, at the Warhammer sabers, but also stocks like the conchers, they, they had a liking for pistols as well, so they even as in their brutal uh, knightly ethos, of course they didn't disdain these weapons as more, also more traditional ones such as maces and even hatchets so they were properly the brightest example of the top uh, professionalism of Western knightly training that again uh, Pike and Shot had somehow put to sleep in the West but that in a more cavalry suited ground like in, in Eastern Europe and in certain parts of Central Europe for that matter um, uh, and against enemies that generally lacked uh, Pike and Shot infantry such as the Ottomans largely did because the the, uh, the the Janissaries also had stopping infantry by some degree but they were mostly uh, assault engineers and, and musketeers right and they 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 were good swordsmen and things like that um, but um, they hadn't developed kind of that rigid discipline now that was taking um, ground so systemically and structurally in in western armies right and you could have found in fact in the in the in the german infantries that were citing the polish hussars at vienna that were actually crucial and are a bit like the uh the unsung um heroes of the situation because they uh, soften up the ottoman ranks enough also for making the uh, the polish uh, cavalry charge uh, succeed and of course combined arms at that point were not uh, an option or they, they had never been right the same the same Polish Hussars in in Polish armies were assigned as we've seen by lighter troops that had all that preparatory function but uh, this uh, again uh, practically still medieval knights in, in that uh, are similar in some ways even in if in in different if for the different background even to this more kind of in fact Ottoman or even Mongol uh, side of the story you realize even this 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 feathers the the general outlook the leopard skins etc were part all of an angelic say both Uranian uh, Uranian and um, Ectonian uh, mix that was proper of this uh, migration era step nomadic culture whatever you want to call it it was pretty much universal and um, in fact much more common right we we know the polish hussars because it's poland and so we 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 see it in a in a from a european perspective as let's say our, our home but again um and so everything that doesn't look similar to to us like more generally uh, as external but again we forget that great parts of the Balkans of Eastern Europe you know Central Europe and beyond uh, and you can even found find a boundary there we're actually pretty much the same in terms of that kind of nightly ethos that at some point was also anachronistic but that in the Polish case succeeded uh, because it was also comforted by that aspects of modernity that uh, that the Polish army could, could afford by some degree, right? The Ottoman Sipai instead was destined to um, to succumb exactly on that occasion, right? The fact that the Ottomans at least didn't have the, the chance or the capacity to field an equivalent to counter that charge um, in time. The Polish Slachta naturally would pay in kind against the most kind of statally oriented uh, permanent armies of the 18th century that even from a country like Russia was essentially westernized by Peter the Great so developing even there a model that had nothing to do with this previous local tradition and the armies of, of Prussia of Austria succumbed right for not having wanted to in fact 
uh, make the Polish army evolve into something more modern as well. And there is a bitter Clausewitzian note about that. It is actually sympathetic to Poland because it's hard not to be in that um, in that context. But that makes you understand also how uh, Wu cannot defend himself, uh, will not be aided by anyone, right? Which is a very interesting um, consideration to make also in the face of um, for example, of the aggression of Ukraine that instead showed this this massive balls in capacity to be aided and to keep being aided for that matter with the results that we're seeing. Now, um, when we talk about uh, the Polish Hussars, of course, we remember the largest and uh, most important and famous cavalry charged in the annals of military history. On September the 11th, 1683, only the woods north of Vienna separated the Ottoman camp from the Christian Liberation Army. Experienced Austrian chasseurs helped the columns of the Holy League approaching in good order. This aspect is is relevant because, as we've seen, the Ottomans traditionally had pretty good light cavalry, and so uh, don't think that the Westerners weren't able to respond in kind because there are pretty interesting clashes um, also in uh, exactly in this Turkish war that show you that uh, a bit like the the Polish Hussars against the Ottomans, just when it was a solo between Poland and the Ottomans, um, that and we have seen it even in the Crusades. It's absolutely not true that um, the Western heavy knight is too heavy, as a matter of fact, to chase like that, uh, you know, Turkish horse archer carrying out the, the Parthian shot um, in the meanwhile and managing to defeat this, this, this Westerners that base all on technology. The, Actually, first of all, from a strictly military point of view, if you need to ch to to, uh, to run away if somebody's chasing you, it means automatically you're not the strongest one. Because when you have the upper hand, you pass to counterattack immediately. It's not something that you waste because you say, let's also counterattack the enemy. First of all, it's not going to do that if you're too strong. And secondly, you're leaving the initiative to the enemy, which is detrimental to you. It doesn't make any strategic sense. The fact that these people carry out this tactics is that what we tend to underestimate is that Western forces, per se, even though they, they took kind of more time to call us, also in a unitary political sense, were, however, more advanced. Uh, and uh, th there is hardly at least uh, an inferiority there, which we will discuss in, in some, in fact, other videos, like how like the Ottomans were the top in so many things, but uh, what about others? Like, is there a, we lack actually a direct confrontation of that kind, where so many battles, of course, fought between the two, but there were never like, um, at least much of the um, modern type, um, where that were of, say, of the same importance of some sieges like this ones or, or or naval battles. Because uh, in, in, in the latter, for example, the West surpassed the Ottomans. So we have to, um, since the beginning, I mean, uh, so we have to be quite careful here about what we're discussing. It's not for today's video. Um, but moral of the story, don't underestimate even Western light cavalry. And in fact, you can, I mean, videos about this in the 18th century we can appreciate how all these ethnic specialties that came from the Balkans from Eastern Europe etc even entered um, the uh, like uh, the the Western military together with a massive Ottoman influence for example in, in military musical instruments but even more than that as think about the Hulans, the Usars uh, etc and all this kind of uh, still ethnic uh, dimension that somehow echoed the shamanic trances that were used by the, the ancient uh, warrior brotherhoods to, to be, in fact, initiated to 
um, a, a lifetime of, of, uh, of fighting in a universal possessive sense. So um, the progress of the West doesn't stand uh, uniquely in discipline, in that kind of cold, aseptic, uh, modernistic and secularistic mythology that you have been fed with, pretending that that's all what the West was. It, it's actually much more than that, especially the virtus is um, dramatically overlooked in here. And you understand this when you look, well, the Polish Usars are the easy example, but again, don't think those app just apparently spoiled brats living their libertine lives in the, in the courts of Europe, uh, dressing with lace again and uh, being experienced ballet dancers wouldn't uh, be able just to, to go on the battlefield uh, sword in hand against the enemy and you know cutting to pieces people alive and you know being smeared with 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 guts and blood and just being brutally and radically overly exalted in a fanatic way and literally again killing every every person in front of them because it, it was part of the entire essence of these people even sickly individual i mean look at prince eugene he was he was objectively ugly, sickly. Um, uh, it was hardly anybody who would think he he would go literally in the breach of the Battle of Belgrade. He, you know, he killed a sipai first hand. Like that that's the degree you have to imagine those men. And we have all this because we have ridiculized the ancien regime because Fort Estaters uh, have decided that uh, tradition is bad, and so. Uh, we have to believe that uh, it was just a world upside down. Our world is upside down. A world where humans are deprived of any value at this point. And we complain about the aristocracy of the late 17th century. Do you have the palest idea of, 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 of the backbone that those men had? From a, from a moral point of view, like just its magnitude exponentially greater than, than anything you can even hope to wish to dream to to ever become and you should look at yourself in a mirror spitting on your face because uh, how do you have this history and you still live the way people live today and nobody really understands that unless unfortunately in fact nobody knows history and, and that's the sad reality people at the time were deeply imbued with the entire mythological past with the entire archetypal meaning and the Everything, starting from the hierarchy, fit perfectly that logic. And these were the same people who created modernity, not the common people. It was the elite always that accomplished that. The common people just followed, because that's all what they can do. They don't have the means to do it, and that's why they are under, and they're, they, sti they are still under. You, it doesn't matter how many rights you, you claim they have. Uh, there's no such thing like equality of human beings. Thank God. It, there will never be, especially. Um, so, when we we look at the the battle of the end, of course, we have to look at that moral dimension as well. I mean, think what it means. This is well documented, as we will see now, also from Ottoman in Ottoman sources. The the feelings uh, at the first appearance of the enemies. Literally, this huge army appearing just out of the Viennese forest um, and bringing Kara Mustafa to ha that understood the mistake only at that point, hastily gathering uh, only a few thousand men that were ready for that task. The others were all engulfed in, in the trenches or at least were to, to be redeployed, re, um, you know, um, even just pulled out of. Of, of of the mud there um, and ordered because he was freaking out at that point he could have just defended but he ordered an impromptu attack hoping to pin down the Christians in place right so that's how the battle actually answered uh, um, the Danube before the two armies were fully arrayed even the German army, it, as we've seen, it was a sort of Polish-German coalition, most. There were lots of other people, but that, that was the core. 
began to slowly push the Turks back. And that's where the Western infantry began to show the Ottomans the accomplishments that had been achieved, in fact, in the Western Central European battlefields. Um, a very methodic uh, volley fire, pretty orderly one, to maximize the effect on, on the ranks at, at a single time, uh, at a time in sequence, um, and thus, um, you know, actually shattering the Turks that uh, were not habituated to receive such an intense and constant fire at the same time was disrupting their formation. Uh, they were also naturally striking back um, and there were f fierce um, clashes and uh, these um, again contrast you could imagine with you know uh, a western musketeer meeting with I don't know some obscure Anatolian um, horse archer still looking like uh, I don't know coming from um, half a millennium ago uh, and mostly ending with the latter you know having a you know a musket ball transpassing his chest um, in a blood explosion and and this kind of extremely brutal feats in fact you know Turkish blades were also pretty um, pretty effective at close range but try to come at close range and, and try even to to counter the enemy with something that can equate those volleys with our uh, with with bows you will not make it alone of course there were also important uh, firearms as we've seen from the from the Ottoman side but not so well distributed nor the infantry especially was so collectively trained like the Western one the best musketeers were the Janissaries that as we will see now were actually kept by Kara Mustafa in the trenches in front of the city. That's how the Germans began to push the Turks back uh, uh, in spite of the strong stubborn resistance that these wars didn't you know wouldn't make these warriors given in immediately. At about four in the afternoon the Polish army that was separated from the German, German one finally emerged from the force. By this point, Kara Mustafa had finally managed to deploy all his forces in a continuous line of almost six kilometers. Right, this had been carried out uh, with, with difficulty, finally managed. Of course, the order was not optimal but that's the the price to pay for such a uh, sudden waking up as we've seen only the Janissaries continued actually a desperate assault on the city because they hoped to still reverse the ties by literally seizing Vienna and possibly even becoming the besieged ones but uh, especially you know with those numbers uh, the the Holy League would have probably abandoned even the, the idea of of besieging a Turkish held Vienna. It was um, perhaps the, the best the Ottomans could react at that point, but truly wasn't a particularly um, insightful decision too because, you know, if, for example, the Janissaries had been brought in time, we didn't know their, their organizational difficulties that must have been high, of course. Um, they, they could have you know, at least if the, the Holy League army had been destroyed, like Vienna would have surrendered anyway. So even if the besieged could maybe m make sorties and destroy some, some, you know, Ottoman infrastructure uh, in the trenches along the camp, I mean, not much would have changed per se, right? Um, the Janissaries deserve a mansion because they were somehow wasted like that, but they were a hell of a of our military whore. As you know, this had been created by the Ottoman sultans um, as early as the 14th century. They properly emerged as the sultanial army, or at least there was um, even a narrower core that I made a video on that, but um, they they embodied sultanial rule in the empire, right? They were the army of Constantinople in, in many ways. Um, 
and and before Constantinople, as you understand, um, they they provided their army, right? They had actually heavy cavalry themselves. There were within the Janissaries even some places for freemen to make career as officers and so on. There was even a an important degree of equipment customization because the Sultan's arsenals naturally provided with the, with the best uh, and greatest range, uh, various variety of equipment, of armament, too. Uh, but the core was famously constituted, as we were saying before, by a solid contingent of infantry. Right, there was something in between, again, musketeers, assault melee troops, um, assault engineers, um, from the outset, the Janissaries formed the heart of the Ottoman armies, right? restoring essentially a permanent military force to a war stage in, in a grand style. They were the first one as such, because as we've seen, the Ottoman Empire came to be so large and powerful that, of course, the, the Janissary core grew accordingly. Um, and at the time, no Western power really had so many... Uh, drilled permanent troops like the the Sultan had in the Janissaries. Their recruitment, famously enough, known as Dev Shirme, took place by forcibly enlisting every five years the best performing adolescents among the Christian families of the European provinces, um, thus also obtaining the aim of depriving those treacherous areas of the best energies. Um, this had originally been done by literally kidnapping children, even among uh, pretty primitively brutal and warlike, but in this sense, sturdy and tough, also uh, genetically, populations in, in the Balkans. Uh, by the late 17th century, this had transformed into a much different system of kind of political cooptation, in fact, of the elites, in a much more, to, to the point that there were people that actually would give their children. Um, to the Sultan, because uh, the Janissaries had so many privileges that uh, they remembered who their parents were, and when they became rich, they would actually give them land and all this stuff. Naturally, it was a very different world from our own, and um, it was, generally speaking, also quite brutal in, in its own way. Um, Janissaries had some interesting, um, even heretical cult that was somehow opposed to the Sunni orthodoxy of the Sultan, but again, that embodied in the relation between the adoptive father and this kind of slave soldiers, slave children, uh, the, the perfection, the order, the hierarchy of, of the system, uh, of the universal empire achieved by, by the Osman dynasty. Um, as young men, they converted to Islam, uh, because of course only Muslims were allowed to own weapons within um, the uh, Islamic uh, community, so that they were sent to barracks where they would live a long part of their lives until they reached uh, retirement. Um, they were dressed in uniform, that's also a pretty modern uh, characteristic of the Janissaries that developed also over time, gathered in companies of 200 men called Orta, um, so maintaining also a uh, a tradition of these units uh, that could reinforce the esprit de corps, etc. They were dramatically drilled. They marched all in this frightening pace that was also kind of, kind of turning uh, the first step 45 degrees and then 90 and 90 from left to right. And so this also scenographically caused all this man to, to, to change. Um, front of 90 degrees all the time and it, it, it looked impressive because it was a way of saying look at what we can make these men do just for the sake of showing how drilled they are we can't afford the resources even to train them for this um, and this is nothing in comparison of course of the psychophysical training they underwent uh, that forged them into a very disciplined military force of uh, as we were saying before mostly of marksmen First, they were archers as such, then uh, arquebus men, and then arquebusiers, if you prefer, and then musketeers. Um, and remaining throughout all this time skilled, perhaps even more 
than with firearms in the use of sabers and axes, right? Um, Ottoman snipers in the early modern era were, were a thing, even by, by Western standards. The Europeans were impressed in those duels at the siege of Malta regarding the, the accuracy of, of um, the Ottoman fire. The um, Janissaries enjoyed such a fame that, as we've seen, they were imitated by various European countries, and, uh, at least in terms of uniform and type of discipline, mo very modest forces, mostly that I know in, in Poland, that perhaps was uh, perhaps the most similar of all um, European countries to, to the Ottoman uh, model. Right in, uh, especially from a military point of view, at least the, the by the scale, right in type of political and social control dynamics, right, and that that's quite an interesting thing to say because also, as you know, the the Commonwealth, as we've seen, was huge. How to present the again most important cavalry charge in in history? Um, it's impossible. In fact, I will not do it today. At least we will. Uh, briefly discuss it, but it deserves at least uh, a video on its own. First of all, I would invite you, um, here I upload some, some of these pictures, some have already passed, but to look at, especially in the, there are many modern, even contemporary paintings, but some, especially the, the contemporary ones from, from the 17th century, about Jan Sobieski. And looking at the artist's use of light and the broader symbology, right? You will notice that Sobieski was represented after the victor, but generally speaking, as the king of Poland, but even more after this clamorous achievement that is unspeakable in 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 in, in nature and character. And, it's, and again, it's it's almost impossible to phrase of what had been. Uh, seen as literally the transfigurational um, uh, achievement of an imperial ruler, right? Even surpassing the Holy Roman Emperor in military power, might, and prestige. In fact, somebody phrased um, John's intervention, quoting uh, the Gospel of Saint John because of the same name, Jan, Fuit homo missus adeo, cui nomen erat Ioannes. So, literally, um, let's say, mirroring that uh, hardcore belief that, again, was surely much more alive in the uh, soul and body of a, of a Polish nobleman regarding that, uh, in fact, transfigurational um, capacity that divine glory had on, the, on this great landlord and prestigious um, monarch in Europe. There, there was a, in late medieval times, there was a quote by, by a, 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 Polish, a Polish king designed to trigger uh, the Holy Roman Emperor because uh, the, the Polish king told him, look, you know, between the Holy Roman Emperor and, and God, there is the Pope, because without your crown, you, uh, the, the papal crown, you cannot um, become emperor. Instead, the Polish king answers only to God. Actually, it was the same thing. It was just like a bit of Polish um, uh, cockery, let's say, and also kind of um, anti-German resentment already at the time. Um, but um, it, it speaks of you of exactly how these uh, peoples that had been Christianized the way they had been, let's say, and that they were kind of more distant from civilization, were much more deeply um, obsessed with this almost step cult of militarism, of, of, of horses, of, you know, riding into hell or to heaven in this this uh, dramatic existential trial in a bath of blood um, in considering their their power earned on the battlefield as the only thing that, that truly matter. 
it's in this key that you have to read Jan Sobieski's personal comment and leadership of 3,000 winged hussars and other 20,000 men in what is remembered as the largest cavalry charge in history. There is a Turkish chronicle that sounds like this. The infidels sprouted on the slopes together with their divisions like storm clouds covered with blue metal, as if a torrent made of pitch black were pouring out. You realize what this means. Of course, this is a dark chronic metaphor. Of course, from a, from a Polish pers but also German perspective, uh, this would have uh, you know appeared like angels, right? And that's what actually the, the symbol of the the vertical feather wings on the backs of the Polish hussars really was about, right? The, the angels of death, the messengers of divine glory and of divine wrath. Like would devour the souls of those who could not heroically uh, oppose the, the fury of of these horsemen, um, and so this idea of a torrent made of pitch black, right, of blue metal, um, literally swarming against in a, in a charge. So imagine this very plastically, very dynamically, what it could look like. The sound the sound of the horses galloping and eventually the impact that was uh, remember that cavalry charges uh, um, against uh, enemies of you know of, of equal uh, strength were were heard at, at a distance right of kilometers uh, historically and the the impact of such a mass had a devastating effect on the Turks who tried in vain to counterattack. As we've seen, the Turks had at that point several tens of thousands of men the least right in the in the fight. Uh, the Germans were fifty thousand, the Poles uh, the Poles were thirty thousand essentially. They were pretty balanced. Uh, in number, the, the Ottomans likely having some advantage, but being more poorly deployed. The Polish charge in particular could not be adequately countered by the Ottomans on their left, because the right flank um, had been worn down by the German infantry, as we've seen. Plus, even on the Ottoman right, uh, the charge of a single squadron of Polish winged hussars had breached it, right, threatening to outflank the entire Islamic array. So, a situation that highlighted the uh, all the uh, cons, let's say, of what this Ottoman force had uh, been. Uh, Composed, led, uh, and, and employed, employed like. Kara Mustafa tried uh, to reassemble the ranks, looking in vain for death himself at the head of his bodyguard, right? Because he knew what the price of failure was for the Ottoman Grand Viziers. Um, and it's as if the entire army um, had lost cohesion in Munich, right? Um, with all reasonable chance of resisting failing, the Ottoman army routed. So basically this was only one big impactful charge after an important, again, softening up at the hands, or better, the muskets of uh, the German infantry. Um, the Poles literally ran over the, the Ottoman army, they reached the camp, they, they, uh, they slaughtered anybody they found in front of them. The Germans advanced from their side, the Janissaries were caught uh, practically between two fires, and um, some of them, however, managed to escape. Right? The, the, the Ottoman army was so big that uh, the, the, the Christian forces that, by the way, were exhausted by the fight, because the Turks initially put up a very strong uh, resistance, uh, in spite of the odds, right? 
uh, caused by a disorder, by a surprise, mostly th th this moral uh, difference. But it was a huge army, as we have seen. Um, and it was at 6 in the evening all in fact that the battle died out around Vienna because some pockets resisted. Prince Eugene, for example, participated to the fight mostly um, in the clearing of the Ottoman trenches in front of Vienna's gates. Um, so surely uh, minor engagements uh, that however remained impressed uh, in the minds of those who participated and that were not less risky by some degree but of course at that point most of um, what the Christians did was mopping up uh, operations uh, per se. Um, there are uh, enormous um, you know uh, amounts of anecdote about this all especially the entire Ottoman camp falling in the hands of uh, of the Christians. Mm, I would just make a special mention to the parrot of the Grand Vizier Sarail that, you know, when the um the Christians entered the 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 quarter fly away um in the Danubian plain not to be found anymore. Uh that's always a story that has <laughs> struck me for that man. Um, Karim Mustafa's end was dramatic, as you know, because he managed to flee to Belgrade. He may even to rally his forces, that naturally at that point were shattered, and the entire political strategic balance of Central Europe had radically shifted in favor of now a remarkable Christian forces that went on to, to win also other clashes during the same season. Um, I should point out that even though this clash uh, took place, as you understand, the siege, the battle in August, September, um, this was a par was a particularly cold one, even for Central European standards. It rained a lot, um, so it wasn't easy, right? And both contenders were were exhausted by this. But the sheer damage caused to the Ottoman military would engulf the uh, the Ottoman Empire for years in brutal turmoils. Um, of revolts, etc., of which the Christians, as you know, during the rest of the, of the Great Turkish War, took advantage. Um, in spite of some setbacks, essentially, the Habsburgs regained control of uh, what, what, what was essentially the Hungarian, had been the Hungarian kingdom just, um, just a century and a half before. Right? Reflect uh, on this, because um, the legacies there were important for what would become the Austro-Hungarian Empire as well. Um, um, Karim Mustafa uh, began to accuse his troops of cowardice, that he had been betrayed, all these kind of things, but it was the Janissaries who held him guilty of the disaster that uh, made him uh, fall unavoidably at that point. Um, and Karim Mustafa was presented with the silk rope with which the uh, broke grand viziers were presented with. And one should point out that um, Karim Mustafa's death was very dignified because he accepted his fate and he was strangled like that. He, he kneeled in front of the guards and so he was done and his head was sent to the Sultan in a precious velvet suitcase. Um, well, what else to say about this all? I, I will not go on with you know the, the rest of the campaign and uh, say the broader consequences that can be discussed in another in another video, of course. But you can just you know check wi Wikipedia if you don't know them yet, because they are on every history book, uh, school book. Um, but um, there is a general. Mm, consideration that one could make in a, in a broader sense. Uh, the Battle of Vienna's uh, lesson, moral, wh whatever you want to call it like, um, cannot be resumed in such a short time. In any case, what we see in the history of the Habsburgic Empire is definitely a major turning point that would open 
to a new season that was not just in fact um, you know the, the construction of the Austrian Empire as we know in its magnificence before we don't really say the Austrian Empire um, the Habsburgs had other territories but we mostly talk about Austria and what were the um, you know the other possessions in the rest of Germany that and Italy and uh, there was of course also the entire Bohemia that was dynastically of the Habsburgs etc uh, we're talking naturally about um, a dynasty that had been severely defeated in the Thirty Years War that had had to renounce with the uh, Treaty of Westphalia to broader hegemonic projects over Germany that could be resumed only in the 19th century and to be fundamentally um, uh, stripped um, from them by the Prussian unification of, of the country um, and more could be discussed in, in, in that um, in that regard but it's in fact the construction of an empire was mostly based on territories just like Prussia by the way and territories that lay out of Germany right uh, Hungary in the case of the Habsburgs and many other territories that were stripped from uh, wrestled from the from the Ottomans and mostly preserved till the end in fact of the uh, of the same Austro-Hungarian Empire the end of World War the first there's all a world that develops from there. It's mostly the world that we come to appreciate, if not with Charles the, the Sixth, especially with Maria Theresia, uh, Joseph the Second, the great um, um, Austrian Enlightenment uh, that uh, brings the country properly to a to another level, right? Also of cultural achievement, also a military, military one, because as you know, what the, the the French had managed to do with the Sun King would be accomplished concretely by the by Austria and Prussia just by the mid 18th century um, Poland as we were seen saying before um, wouldn't uh, save herself e even after this magnificent victory that surely um, fixes Jan Sobieski in the Imperium of the greatest military commanders uh, of the modern age um, to say the least and um, that's also a context that we should analyze politically especially from within Poland to, to appreciate more properly the Ottoman Empire was surely delivered the the heaviest blow it had ever suffered because from this time onwards it would never recover uh, the, Ul the Ulamas in, in the 18th century prevented uh, the country from modernizing alongside the Western patterns, and up to that point, it was still good, but was still good potential after all. Um, the crack was not so sudden in the broader entirety of, of of the empire, but of course the blow was felt dramatically, and the, the Ottoman Empire would become the great sick mm, of, kind of European powers. Um, in the in the centuries to come uh, of course the French ambitions were also frustrated because essentially it, we've seen it with the video about the Sun King a couple of weeks ago uh, Louis XIV uh, uh, a force uh, of turning France in a essentially in the uh, in the new empire Europe were thwarted, right? F F France remained essentially the uh, hegemonic continental power, but um, the Habsburgic victory allowed um, essentially a, a, a broader alliance of countries that, as we've seen, also culturally I had a very few to do with each other. I mean, pick Austria and, and the Netherlands, <laughs> right? You know, like cats and dogs, not just. Uh, in the diametrically opposite sense uh, of the German geography and considered that in that sense the Netherlands were the only country that truly seceded from the Holy Roman Empire it was still Switzerland but it was another story even though there was a story of anti Habsburgic issues too but with Britain etc in a world where confessional clashes uh, the idea of the crusade would objectively die out after especially the great Turkish wars, right, that uh, highlighted, of course, the needs also of 
a greater empire to be more pragmatic and provided the Habsburgs also with properly the material means to uh, not just to, to 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 boast their their moral standards that they had tried um, to 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 invest in just internationally given that they didn't have saints in their family that they didn't have well so to say if we act in a stern way we will look better at least and um and it's the history of the world that the changes of course um it's the history of prince eugene that in that french connection was the refused general that the sun king could have and that he would bitterly in fact um res you know suffer of for having as you know not given him a chance where, where he could as a as a French officer in in the royal army, um, and there is in in this regard the the emergence again of a Central European dimension that remains less defiled than it had been for for centuries um, in properly manifesting that role in the world, and of course the Habsburgic Empire embodies that, right? Because it was one of the few basically was a continental power, a purely continental power, aside from you know some some ships, some companies in the in the Habsburgic uh, Netherlands and and some you know Adriatic um, possessions was basically land power. Didn't have colonies abroad, so it's another power of the 19th century that, however, didn't have colonies abroad, like uh, um, at least from that kind of broadly Western perspective that we can appreciate. Um, and so another side of the story that I presume today is neglected, is lost, right? Whenever we talk about Germany today, the, the, the standard is, this is completely arbitrary, a Northern European country. How is Germany Northern European country? Having to appreciate it, the concept of Mitteleuropa, that is it's something much deeper and more more uh, larger and also more historically low even than northern europe for that matter um what about austria what about the legacy of this uh, enormous um, traditional empire that everybody says well like you know this is how it passes among war gamers of the seven years war of, of um of the Napoleonic Wars, as ah, you know, the Austrians are the white ones that are lame, you know, they're not so cool like the others. Um, and or oh, I was just this anachronistic empire that was worthless and whatever. There are so many things that connect us um, with that world, even if you are part of the, um, I can proudly say that uh, part of my my ancestry were, were proud Habsburgic subjects for that matter, uh, as well as of, of the of the Holy Roman Empire altogether, and that that's where the tradition, uh, per se, is to be, um, in my opinion, rediscovered entirely. But even if you are French or if you are British or if you are uh, Spanish, the, the Spanish understand this more because, of course, of of, of the Habsburgic connection as well, from the other branch, even though they were de facto two different things. Um, that uh, even in the Ukrainian. Uh, uh, history, for example, is to be important to remember. I made a video about how essentially at least the modern Ukrainian nation, for not talking about the previous one, that developed on its own, of course, and that had to do with yet another central power. Uh, and Galicia is still uh, Central European, I mean, that is the, the same Commonwealth, right? Developed, in fact, within, in the 19th century after Poland was dissolved, within the Habsburgic Empire. And that's the truest core of Ukrainian national identity, not the Russian part, by the way. And I explained abundantly why in that video. So, um, uh, trying to recover this um, this aspect, even reflecting on the fate of Poland, that's yet another thing. Like we, uh, my um, perhaps I shouldn't say this because I, of course, stress the importance of winning, and that's what I firmly believe by fate, but in this sense, reflecting on those who lost very often can be even more more important, and not because we have to praise them in any particular way, 
actually we should find what was the problem there why did somebody get itself killed and lost uh, in the process and the same you can ask yourself for the Ottomans you can ask for any of these powers that fundamentally do not exist anymore as such especially in a traditional fashion because uh, as I was saying in the beginning of the video you can't speak of like a at least in the age of, of nation state of of the same po um, of, of the same countries we are naming by approximation of being the core of these um, cultural realities it, it's it's different right and until you learn that difference you will never appreciate history per se and I think the Battle of Vienna in this sense uh, offers in its background um, of course even in, in its military history but in its political meaning in my opinion that the great uh, one of the greatest at least examples of such greatness because that imperial universal awareness is being completely removed and uh, also this as a great Catholic victory that uh, Central Europe largely is a Catholic culture the gigantic as underestimated efforts and success of the papacy in the Battle of Vienna because again without the diplomatic coordination papal finances etc no army no Holy League and nobody remembers that either um, and the fact that Poland was a Catholic country that Austria was um, as much as France was and that also makes you understand many things regarding the, the alliances here and what dynamics exist the differences between Austria and Poland there are not few it must be understood um, and finally the general um, political and strategic appreciation that especially the most military versed uh, followers were surely uh, see in kind of in probably in an imperial scale like what the Habsburgs were able to do after the victory that is enlarging again their, their power to, to a degree that never been seen so uh, a major shift to say the least um, in European policy as basically you had never seen because what was really the last blow of that kind right arguably yes maybe in relative terms the same fall of Constantinople and the same destruction of Hungary could compare um, but at the same time those weren't complete switches like um, they weren't blows that could put in crisis yet another system that was larger as much as the Ottoman Empire was by still the late 17th century and for what even could be achieved proportionally by the Habsburg so it, it's a very different reality it's a much greater um, theater if you want um, and it had huge ramifications also in probably Western European history narrowly meant even Northern European history Southern European history of course because we also talk about this Venice passed to the counter-attack in Greece again so also there, was, there is all the Italian perspective that deserves uh, much greater consideration um, I would say the perspective even of the peoples that were living within the Ottoman Empire and how they reacted to this an Hungarian perspective for example it's most fascinating but even a Serbian one a Balakian one a uh, you know a Bulgarian one etc and more of course um, what else to say um, at the beginning of the video I warned you that this would be just um, a quickly condensed um, content so I didn't betray your trust um, and uh, I hope to update soon also with, with uh, many other in-depth videos about the siege of Vienna that again as you know have become somehow frequent companions um, for anybody who follows me regularly for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye